All right, what is a hot rod? Now this here happens to be a what's called a 2932. It's got a 29 Model A body and chassis and a 32 radiator and grill shell. And of course, 32 is the year that Ford began manufacturing the Flathead V8. Now, the Flathead V8 is uh, probably the prettiest motor there is, and uh, in a hot rod form, it usually has multiple carburetors and a finned head, but in 1932, it didn't. Um, now, the, the reason I'm making this video is because I came across this paragraph on the internet. It says, the oldest known uses of the term hot rod are from the 1930s when car owners in Southern California would modify their cars and race them on the huge dry lake beds northeast of Los Angeles. Uh, let's see, then it uh, goes on to say, the origin of the term hot rod is unclear. The origin of the term hot rod is unclear? Well, it's not to me, so I decided I would make this video. I know exactly where the term came from, and I'm, doing, I'm going to tell you all about it. Here is a 1932 Ford Flathead V8. Uh, back in the uh, 30s and 40s and even the 50s, the, this engine was all over the place. It was readily available, abundant, and probably about the only V8 platform that uh, guys that had felt the need for speed had to work with. Now, <clears throat> the smallest the in dimension uh, V8, uh, Ford Flathead V8, was the 42 through 46. It cooled better, it was uh, sturdier, and like I said, it had uh, it was smaller. It could fit into the engine bay of a Model A uh, really well. You could put it in a, in a Willys and just about anything. Um, so it, it's the most desirable. Now, to understand the term hot rod, you need to understand a little bit about the Ford Flathead V8. You see how close together those valves are? Um, flatheads just inherently don't breathe really well. So they're generally what's called under square. They have a longer stroke than they do a bore. And that, it doesn't really overcome the breathing problem, but it, it minimizes it. Now, if you're going to make this a, a faster car, you can't increase the size of those valves. They're already on to, almost on top of each other. And to put in bigger pistons, uh, would be two steps forward and one step back because you'd be developing your R your peak horsepower at a higher RPM and that would compound your breathing problems and um, yeah that's about it uh, you, you'd want to breathe more with bigger pistons and those valves just won't let you do it so what you do is you turn the engine upside down if you want more performance and you deal with the bottom end you take out that crankshaft you take it down to a machine shop and you say here, what I want you to do is grind these rod journals off, um, grind these rod journals off center so that they're further away from the center line of the crankshaft. Uh, of course, you do your math first. You figure out how far into the uh, combustion chamber your, your piston can be allowed to go before uh, it hits anything. You, uh, you, know, you figure out what undersized rod journal bearings are available so you don't run into problems later on. But you see, that accomplishes a number of things. Uh, you've taken the, uh, the swing further away from the center line of the crankshaft, so you're increasing the distance that the piston travels from bottom to top, and by invading the combustion chamber, the, the, uh, it raises the compression. That compounded with the fact that the piston travels further up and down so it takes in more air and compresses that air into an even smaller area so it raises the compression it increases the piston speed it lengthens the stroke it, it reduces the rpm at which the engine creates its peak torque it uh, <clears throat> doesn't eliminate but it decreases the breathing problem because now you're, you're you're taking in the same amount of air you're just taking in a little bit more of it uh, not only that, but you have a smaller rod journal, which, of course, it reduces the friction uh, that uh, a larger rod journal would have. And so that reduces drag, of course. And, of course, the, the bottom line of all this is you get a lot more power. You throw some ethyl into the fuel tank, and you're good to go. And that's uh, called making the rod hotter. So after you do this, you say, okay, I've hot-rodded the engine. 
So that is indeed where the term hot rod came from. And um, you can take that to the bank, that is true. And uh, my first significant job was in 19, in the 70s was uh, in a shop in Long Beach that made Babbitt bearings. Now, even though our principal client was the Navy and we made a lot of industrial bearings, uh, we had a lot of hobbyists and a lot of old guys that, uh, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 years earlier were making hot rods. And uh, so I've had some really nice conversations with these old fellows that came into our shop wanting us to make uh, Babbitt bearings for their, uh, their, old, their old stuff. Anyway, that's it. So anyway, there's a picture of another 2932, only this one's got a Chevy engine. Now, are you going to hot rod a Chevy engine? Well, it depends on what you mean by hot rod. You're sure not going to, you know, grind the rod journals off center so they're further from the center line of the crankshaft. On, on an overhead valve engine, uh, that would be a lot of falder all for a little return. Uh, on this car, you'd want to, you know, polish the ports or make the valves bigger or, uh, you know, make it, uh, you know, or bore the cylinders, big, give it bigger pistons. Uh, on an overhead valve, there, there's possibilities that will give you better yield than uh, doing the hot rod trick. So does that mean only Ford flatheads can be hot rods? Well, heck no. I don't think anybody's going to disagree that that's a hot rod, and so is this. <clears throat> now, we do have to discuss what a hot rod is not. Can you just walk into the showroom of a Bugatti dealer or a McLaren dealer and buy the fastest car, any, a, a, a car that's faster than any hot rod out there? Well, no. You buy a car straight from the dealership, that's not a hot rod. That's just a, a, a stock car. Uh, what about this? When you give a car a fancy paint job, does that make it a hot rod? No, it just makes it a custom. What about this? If you have something that's old and beautiful, does that make it a hot rod? No. It doesn't have to be beautiful. As a matter of fact, hot rods can be junk. <laughs> you get Here, got a picture of a junk. Where is it? There it is. How's that? <laughs> Is that a hot rod? I don't know. I, I don't know what's under the hood. It looks like it's getting along, along quite nice, and it might not in its stock trim, so that might be a hot rod right there. So the definition of a hot rod is just anything that is has had its performance improved over and above what the factory intended. Now, whether you start with something like this that's been sitting in a field for 50 years, or you start with something like this that uh, just you know, shoved in the corner and all needs is washed. It doesn't matter if it's got more horsepower than the factory intended, you have a hot rod. Does it have to be American? No. Does it have to be old? No. Uh, it just <clears throat> has to be improved for performance. It doesn't have to be a car or a truck or a motorcycle. Didn't, uh, uh, didn't the Millennium, Millennium Falcon have some special modifications made by Han Solo himself, you can hot rod a spaceship. Whatever it has is has modifications that led to higher performance. In today's parlance, is a hot rod. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Now I don't know if that's a Volkswagen or a Studebaker, but that's sure. Uh, in my book, that's a hot rod. All right, that's all I had to say. You have a great day.